And here I am once again. This is John Lewis Brooks. We're picking up at chapter 6, verse 33 of the book of Second Kings. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him. And he who was the king said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Notes. Uh, now Jehoram is basically blaming God for all the problems. Jehoram had apparently, to some extent, repented of his hasty message and had hurried after the messenger to give Elisha one further hit at life. We must understand that they had been in communication previously on the subject of the siege and that Elisha had encouraged the king to wait for an interposition of God himself. The king now urges that the time for waiting is over and in effect he says, what use is there in, in waiting any longer? Uh, why should he not uh, break with Jehovah, uh, behead, this, uh, behead this lying prophet, and surrender the town? Uh, what has Elijah to say? I mean, what importance is he? But anyways, chapter 7. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Notes. How amazing is grace that in response to the, uh, to the murderous unbelief of the king's heart and the scornful unbelief of the messenger, well, God promised such an abundance of food and so soon that it was to be had for almost nothing. That's an act of grace, my friends. You're feeding the very people that are basically your enemies. Verse 2. Then a lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he who was Elisha said, Behold, you shall see it with your own eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Notes. Well, the reward of unbelief would be death, as the reward of unbelief is always death. Continuing. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Notes. Now, that's a very, very interesting question. They're basically saying, What do we have to lose? You see, leprosy in the Old Testament was a type of sin. Its horrid desperation was such that in the eyes of Israel a leper was completely hopeless. How many Christians find themselves presently in such a perilous condition? A condition, we might add, so disastrous that there is no help from any quarter except for God himself. But nevertheless, no condition is such that God cannot change it. Why sit we here until we die? In these very words you can feel faith. How many Christians give up? How many have quit? You see, faith demands action, and so these four lepers will act. They're basically saying, we're just sitting here doing nothing. What do we have to lose? Verse 4. If we say we will enter into this city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there, and if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. Notes. <laughs> In other words, we have nothing to lose because we're going to pine away anyways with this wretched disease. Continuing. And they rose up in the twilight, in the evening near dark, to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Notes. Well, basically the camp was completely deserted. Verse 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Notes. <laughs> Uh, they thought that some powerful army from a higher nation was coming upon them and they fled. How easy it is for the Lord to do anything. 
how so important it is for the Christian not to limit God, and sadly, how many of us do. Evidently, when these four lepers began to walk toward the camp of the Syrians, the Lord magnified their footsteps until it sounded like the march of a mighty army. We exhibit faith, and God does the rest. But what we must do must be in the will of God. Uh, in other words, those of you who are out there praying for a Cadillac to fall from the sky are just <laughs> not going to get an answer. Verse 7. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried then also and went and hid it. Verse 9. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry until the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. Notes The sun had set the day before on a day of disaster for Samaria, but the sun will now rise on one of the greatest days of blessing in her history. Faith in God would do this very thing. In typology, Samaria is a picture of the world with its hunger, starvation, pain, agony, and wickedness. The lepers, as pitiful as they were, are a type of the preachers of the gospel of good news. The abundance that we have found is a product of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone can basically satisfy the hunger and the craving of a starving world. As the lepers, we must not hold our peace just as they did. We have good news to bring, in fact, the greatest news that a man will ever hear. Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, Jesus delivers, and Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, he's going to take over and he's going to rule the entire world. I don't know how in the world you can get any bad news out of that. Continuing with verse 10. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the, king, uh, to the king's house within. And the king arose in the night, and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. Notes. Well, we're seeing some unbelief, and it always thinks in the negative. But anyways, verse 13. And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray you, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city, and behold, they are as all of the multitude of Israel who are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites who are consumed, and let us send and see. They took therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them into Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels. Uh, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned, and they told the king. Uh, verse 16, And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. And we will have to pick up in chapter 7, verse 17 of the book of Second Kings. Thank you, and God bless.